Welcome to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. It is wonderful to see so many of you today. This evening is a great privilege and honor for us to launch Professor Tom Plate's latest book. The title is Yo-Yo Diplomacy, An American Communist Tackles the Ups and Downs Between China and the US. Now, Tom is a well-known figure to many of us. He has uh, written a series of books on the giants of Asia's, Asia, uh, which includes Conversations with Lee Kuan Yew and Conversations with Mahathir Muhammad, which he informs me he also launched in this school, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, so Tom wears many hats. He is a distinguished scholar of Asian and Pacific affairs and clinical professor at Loyola Marymount University. He had previously also taught at UCLA classes on media ethics and Asian politics. He is a renowned journalist and editor, having worked at uh, the LA Times, and is now a South China Morning Post columnist with fortnightly columns about China. He is also vice president of the Pacific Century Institute. Now, Tom has written 13 books and has received a number of journalism awards, including from the American Society of Newspaper Editors. Now, about his latest book, our former Foreign Minister George Yeo, himself a keen observer of China, has this to say, and I quote, Tom Plate is an atypical commentator of Asian affairs. He is less wont to judge China and other Asian countries as if they were all falling short of Western standards. He was politically incorrect before political incorrectness became fashionable and remains so. He is neither a China watcher nor a China scholar but he has a sense of China. More importantly, he has what is not in common supply, common sense. This is high praise indeed from George Yu. Now, Tom's book comprises 50 of his columns in the South China Morning Post, uh, spanning a two-year period from 2015 to 2017. He evaluates how best to move forward in the US-China relationship in these columns. Now, in one portion of his introduction, he says the book is written more for the intelligent, caring citizen than the specialist, and that it is a book for peace, not a book for war. It respects China and will not demonize it. It respects the United States, but will not canonize it. I think that this is a wonderful approach to the most important bilateral relationship in the world today. Without further ado, I'll leave Tom to share with us the most interesting insights from his book. But before I hand over, the mic to Tom, I would like to share with you a personal note about Tom. Tom informs me that he became a grandfather about 10 months ago, his first, very first grandson. Congratulations, Tom. First of all, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and people will say that and maybe mean it, maybe not, but I do mean it. Uh, a great respect for this school. I'm a big fan of uh, public policy education. Uh, Selena went to SICE, which is one of the best. I went to Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, which is one of the best. And I'm um, a huge admirer of the founding dean, uh, Kishore Mabubani, who I consider one of my best friends and someone who has encouraged me over the years. I've uh, dealt with a number of the professors on the faculty. Uh, the school, in a very, very short period of time, has become the number one policy school in Asia, which is no little achievement. I'm not at all surprised when I, when I come to Singapore, I often feel that per capita, it has the highest IQ of any country I've ever been in. Uh, you are very, very smart, well-educated people, and it's always a great pleasure for me to come here because uh, I like being around really smart people. I, I feel challenged, invigorated, and refreshed, and, uh, and uh, that's my, my sense of Singapore the smartest place that I know, really. The second thing I want to say is I want to thank my publisher, Marshall Cavendish, and the editor-in-chief, uh, uh, May Lynn. Are you here? May Lynn, uh, did you leave? Where are you, dear? Hey, lady, my editor-in-chief. And, uh, and Mindy, uh, Mindy Pang, who is uh, the marketing director there. She is, what are you doing over there in the corner, Mindy? Huh? You're marketing? Oh, you're texting, of course. Uh, she's uh, that, that generation. Uh, Marshall Cavendish has published uh, all of my books on Asia. It's one of the best publishers in Asia if you want to write serious books. And uh, I, um, they want to publish the books that I want to write. And so it's been a great relationship. And uh, we have resuscitated one of the giants of Asia, just as 
Mahanti has resuscitated himself at the age of 92. I sent him a note and I thanked him very much for helping sales. Uh, and uh, and uh, I do recommend, I, I do really like that, that, the, that book, I have to say, because he turned out to be such a, I mean, he, I, I, it was the second book I did, and the first one was on Lee Kuan Yew. How do you follow Lee Kuan Yew? Well, you can't. But so we, I went up to quit KL, and I said to Mahathir, um, you know, I'm just doing this book with uh, Lee Kuan Yew, you know, this guy down. You know who he is? Yeah, I, said, yeah, I know who he is. And um, uh, Giants of Asia and so forth. And, you know, what I don't understand is here's this little place, Singapore, you know, as the Indonesians say, little red dot, five million people and so forth. And why is Lee Kuan Yew a giant? when the head of, of Malaysia with 25 million is not a giant of Asia. There's something wrong there, you know? He says, there is! Uh, and I looked at him and then, you want to do it? He says, yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> and that's how we did uh, the Mahatia book. So thank you for being here and for the sales staff. Uh, 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 and please buy the book, because I'm trying to live on a professor's salary and it's, you know, it's pathetic. And finally, I'd like to introduce uh, my, my, my university, Loyal Marymount University, which is in Los Angeles. It's a mile from the Pacific. It's one of the most beautiful campuses. It's historically Jesuit, but it's historically Jesuit uh, in the very best way. They, uh, uh, it is a really liberal arts college that is, uh, tries to give you a very rounded education with a sense of ethics, and uh, it is not, it, 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 half, less than half the students are Catholic. It's not a Catholic instructional university. And the Jesuits, in some ways, are as secular as anybody in the world. And we have with us tonight the senior vice president of Loyola Marymount, who is in charge of external relations. His name is Dennis Sloan. He also was a policy school graduate of a Kennedy School. Is Kennedy School, is that in Boston? Cambridge, yeah. The Ken <laughs> Harvard Kennedy School. Dennis, would you stand up for a minute and just take a bow? Dennis Sloan, ladies and gentlemen. And then I just, I don't want to embarrass anyone in particular, but I do have a few students here. Uh, Mr. Poe, are you here? Yes, would you just stand up for a minute? He recently graduated from LMU, student in my classes. And, and he was a staffer on, uh, on Asia Media, which is uh, run by students. And we have a, an anthology of some of the best articles that we've had in the last five years. Uh, I have three copies just off the press. And Selena, if you don't mind, I, I would ask you to decide who are the th the, who asked the three best questions, and we'll okay. give you a free copy. That's a price. Uh, right? Yep. Be, okay? Mm -hmm. And you be the judge. Uh, and, uh, and Elizabeth is here. Elizabeth, you want to stand up and take a bow? Elizabeth Celestio. She's a, she is a, uh, uh, a resident of Indonesia uh, in the Borneo way, and she uh, came over here to be with us for a few of the events. And then Dennis and I are going to Jakarta, uh, Tomorrow morning, we do a few alumni events there and, and some uh, and an Asia media event. And uh, we return back to Los Angeles uh, Saturday night and collapse. That's what we're going to do. Uh, what I would like to do is talk 15 minutes and, and not more. Please uh, uh, break in as often as you want, which is my wife does, so I'm well trained. Uh, and, uh, and seriously, on the questions, that's going to be the best part for me, questions and comments. Uh, and I mean that sincerely because actually I was trained, uh, I'm a journalist, uh, I've been a journalist all my professional life and now a professor, so I do both. But journalists learn, you know, learn most by listening, not by talking. I've never learned much by talking, but I learn a lot by listening. So I, I, for me, payoff of the session, in addition to the hundreds of books that you buy, will be the questions you ask and what insights I get out of that. And you might find a little piece of yourself in one of my columns at the South China Morning Post. Uh, but the topic is U.S.-China relations. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I have very strong views on that. Uh, the views are reflected in the book. But I wanted to start with you uh, in a slightly different way and work up to it, because after all, I am from America. I am in Los Angeles. And so uh, it might be possibly that some of you heard of this president that we have. I forget his name. Uh, what was it? D.T. Bump? Bump? Yeah. D.T. Pr President Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you, and so I thought I'd start with that, with, you know, and try and do it in an in a, in a upmarket way. And, uh, and then we move from there <laughs> to U.S. relations with China, and then we'll move to the future, and then we'll go to questions, and we'll see where we are, okay? I had lunch with a very smart man, which is true of the pe all the people that I know as friends, which include not only uh, George Yeo, who I said one of my best friends, but Kishore, 
and, so, and someone else I can't name. And I also had a, um, a, about a 40-minute session with your prime minister uh, yesterday afternoon. It was a very good session. We talked about a number of issues, including the American president. And, um, and I think what you need to understand is, is two things. One is that uh, you probably could guess that I'm not a, a fantastic supporter of the president of the United States and his policies to the extent that he has any that are coherent. Uh, but, um, but I do think he is still the President of the United States, uh, and, uh, and the only place where that is not recognized that I know of is in my home in Beverly Hills by my wife, <laughs> all right? And if I say anything, you know, even arguably positive about Trump, I sleep on the couch. <laughs> and then the other day, I laughed at one of his jokes, and the couch was moved to the curb. So I sleep in the country. So uh, I, have to, I have to say that because I don't want to get into the feminist issue because it's um, so obviously a horrible uh, aspect of the current presidency that it doesn't really need much, much discussion. And um, so uh, what I do want to say, though, is that Trump is not a joke. Uh, we may laugh at him, uh, but he is not. He represents a significant core constituency in the United States. He may actually be supporting policies that are not in their economic interest, but he has a way of connecting in their emotional interest. People who feel that, that the train of history is past their station and they didn't even stop in their station. And it's kind of a get even, it's a little bit frankly, a little bit parallel to the Chinese who feel that they were um, messed over for uh, centuries by the Europeans and so forth. And now it's sort of get even time. There's a bit of a parallelism there. Um, but he, uh, and, 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 and so tr Trump is important. I don't think he'll be reelected, but he might be. All right, so don't have a heart attack if he is, but he might be. Uh, fortunately for real policy, and maybe not, he has an inept majority party in Congress. So you have an inept president and an inept Congress, and therefore it's not too surprising that not a lot is getting done. Now, if, if the things that were going to be gotten done were things that you don't agree with, well, then that's kind of a plus. Uh, it's the best argu argument for uh, incompetency. But if it were things that you think you should be getting done, that, that's the, not a lot is getting done. I believe the Republicans are vulnerable in the fall. I'm not a predictor. I don't really, I don't trust polls anymore after the last election. I don't, I try not to look at them or believe them. Mm -hmm. I don't think they know how to do it anymore. Uh, and people don't want to say, no, I like Hitler, you know, and so on. So uh, the, uh, so, but I do think that he's vulnerable in the fall and I think American politics will become uh, uh, more of a circus, but in a way uh, also perhaps more interesting. His instincts, as far as I can tell, are purely tactical. There was no strategic thinking, uh, and uh, he's dealing really with real estate partners that happen, happen to be countries. And so f flipping a condo is kind of like, you know, having a Korean unification treaty or a denuclearization denuc treaty. Uh, and he is dealing with real estate partners, whoever, however, have thought through their position, in some cases, for decades and centuries. And he has thought through the position for sometimes for seconds. And, um, and, and it's very difficult uh, dealing, uh, negotiating uh, when you, your other partners thought through all of the ramifications and the pluses and minuses. And, and so what happens is he's pulling back and going forward and pulling back. And so if you, if you work for him on his staff, it's a nightmare. I don't know how many of you work for a boss who tells you on Tuesday, you know, he, he or she wants the the wall in red, and then on Thursday now he wants it, in, or she wants it in a different color. And once or twice, that's okay, but as a routine, it, 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 it can drive you crazy. Speaking of crazy, uh, the defense secretary, who's known, I love this name, Mad Dog Mathis. <laughs> I have always, I, really, I like to be called Mad Dog Plate. You know, no student would then ask for a review of the grade. No dean would want to have a, a consultation with me. <laughs> I would not have to go to any departmental meetings because mm -hmm. I was Mad Dog Plate. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be cool? Huh? Well, Mad Dog Math is actually is very good. And, um, and, but unfortunately, Bolton, uh, uh, who is uh, smart, is going to be a problem. 
And uh, sometimes the policies in the White House apparently are formulated uh, by the last person to get Trump's <clears throat> ear. And that, prop, that might be, be Bolton more, uh, more often than anyone else. He personalizes relations too much. Um, uh, I mean, there's a plus to that, obviously. But China is, you know, despite all the brouhaha about the, you know, no more, no, no more term limitations and, you know, uh, she is going to be there forever and so on and so forth. I think he's too smart to stay there forever. Uh, but China is not one person. Mm -hmm. It's not one personality and not one entity. It's a complex phenomenon with many, many moving parts. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, par and the parts, many moving parts in the U.S., on the U.S. side, and these are not coordinated. So that uh, what you have really is a possibility of a lot of friction, some of which is unnecessary uh, if things were uh, more coherent. I am worried a lot. I spoke with your prime minister, as I said yesterday. He said, I said, you, I said to him, are you worried? He said, yes, I am. Um, but it's, um, I'm worried because, in part because of our disarray, and also in part because China has started to believe uh, its own self-assurances that it's made it, mm -hmm. that it's at the top, and it's not at the top. It's getting there, it's going fast, but a lot of things can happen on the way to perfection. And, um, and China, as you know, has been stopped as often by its own internal uh, issues and problems as, as almost as much as anything else, or maybe more, depending on how you, how you, what the metric is. But China feels it's arrived. It also feels that America is falling and falling fast, and I don't really think that's true. I think it just looks like we are because of the president that we have. But I, when I gave a talk at China Daily in Beijing once, and I said that if you're planning, if you're strategizing on the basis that America is going down fast, you're making a key bad assumption. And someone, one, one editor of the China Daily said, but how can that be? America is going downhill. And I said, no, America right now is on a plateau, and you're coming up. But that doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to go past the plateau. Probably you will. But I mean, and it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to go downhill. We may start going up again. I mean, just be careful about your pat assumptions. Um, things are more complicated. And then we got into the whole business of, you know, uh, they're building a second aircraft carrier. You know, I said, big thrill. We got 11. You know, let's have we have a battle of sea, you know, and they're better shooters than we are. I think it is 11. Isn't it 11? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we have a big sea battle. And, you know, you say your guys shoot better than our guys. And so you shoot down, th you know, you kill three carriers. We kill two. You have zero, you know, and we got nine. How do you win on that one? You know, think this thing through, you know? Do we want to get into that? With that as a backdrop, I now want to get into the, the part that really reflects the book a little bit, or at least the first. F See, the beauty of this book is, if you want to read all 50 columns, you can read them. But the, the new part is the first 25 pages or so, where I really talk about the agony of being an American journalist and trying to understand China. It's really hard. And, and, and it's really hard to be, to be smart, to be honest, to be sensitive. You know, uh, many people in the U.S. think, I'm pro-Beijing. Many people in Asia think, like George Joe, that I'm moderate and have mm -hmm. common sense. Um, and, and, but in America now, it's getting very hard to say anything nice about China. It, it uh, is almost a sign of, uh, you know, you're not sophisticated. You don't know what's going on. Even Kissinger's views on China, represented in his book on China, which I regard as a modern classic, and I mean, in Kissinger, if he were, his, he, he were sitting here, I would say, oh, Henry, I'm sorry, but you were wrong on Cambodia, you were wrong on Chile, you were wrong on a whole bunch of things, but you got one thing right. Your entire life, you got one thing right, and it was a big thing, China. And on China is gonna be the, uh, the core book of my, uh, my class in the fall. On China looks at the US, US looks at China. But, but this, is the, this is the key point that I wanna make from the book, and then we'll, we'll talk. That, and this is, I get a little bit evangelical here, but put up with me. Peace is not a, ge a ge geopolitical product or an outcome. It's a moral requirement. No one has the moral right to start a war on this globe, at this time, 
with the weapons options that are available. Who has a nuclear weapon and who does not? Well, Kim, Kim Jong-un has made it clear he has a nuclear weapon. Goody, goody for him. Trump has said our red button is bigger than your red button. That's sophisticated, you know. And then, does Singapore have a nuclear weapon? <coughs> I don't know. I asked the prime minister. He didn't answer that one. <laughs> on Jurong out. Island. Huh? It's on Jurong Island. <laughs> all Sentosa. Well, I, all I said to him was, thank you for not lying to me. Um, Israel, of course, has no nuclear weapon. We all know that, right? <laughs> We're playing with serious stuff here. This applies to us as, 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 as well as to China. We have no right to start a war. No moral right. People are worried. Your PM is worried. And in Washington today, no good word about China may be said. It, the atmosphere has changed rapidly. Um, in Beijing, full steam ahead across the board. Full steam, like boats. Full steam ahead, across the board, from the South China Sea to technology development. Don't get in our way. Made in China, 2025. The American media is coalescing and seeing Mao Zedong under every Xi Jinping move. Especially worried about the American media. I am, because I've worked in it. I know how it works. People here have mentioned a recent Tom Friedman column. Uh, which was very negative about China. Why the sudden change? I said, A, because Friedman doesn't know China or Asia, but that's my own bias. Yeah, he knows the Middle East. I mean, if I were President of the United States, I would put Tom Friedman in charge of the Middle East. Say, so here's the keys, the money, everything, just get it done. But I would, he doesn't know Asia, and he doesn't know China, so he's negative on China, which is the standard conventional thinking right now in America. Now, how many conflicts can we think of that have started up without the press whipping up the winds of war? Am I making this up? What about the Iraq war? How many American newspapers editorialize against the Iraq invasion? How many major ones editorialize against the Iraq invasion? Zero. And look back at what the consensus view of that event was, right? Not positive. How did the American people coalesce, American media coalesce around the idea that that would that was a, would be a wonderful thing. Uh, what is the moral responsibility of the media? And I don't mean just the media, because it's, although the media is fun to beat up on, as we, we make so many mistakes, but even the American academic world, and I, I kind of feel so, a little strongly on this, but there's a, a very famous professor from a school near Boston, I think it's Harvard, and uh, someone I actually greatly respect, and he does a very high quality of work, but, and he's also very famous for recycling the, the Thucydides trap. You know what, what that is, right? So what you have, the way the, the Greeks and the and right, the way they behave, you know, ten, yeah, know years ago, that's now. the way we have to. Yeah, we okay. have to behave now. You know, there's been no change over 2,000 years. Anyway, so he wrote a book, which actually is a pretty good book, but it has this title. Tell me if there's something wrong with me. Destined for war. U.S. China. Destined for war. Destined for, for war. You, we're, gonna, we're destined for war with China. That's what this famous Harvard. So I called him up and I said, famous Harvard professor, I have a question for you. Isn't there some doubt in your mind? Don't you leave a little 10% of optimism? Maybe it won't be. We're destined for peace. All right, destined for peace. I'm going to write that. And, he, and I said, why don't you put a question mark after it? Destined for war question. And he said, well, actually, Tom, tell you the truth, that was the original title. And I took it off. Why'd you take it off? Well, the book publishers thought the, it would sell more copies without the question mark. <laughs> I said, what, are they underpay you at Harvard? Are probably. You, huh? Probably. I don't think so. <laughs> no, Harvard. He, this guy's overpaid. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> From the royalties of this book. What? Right now. Well, now, yeah, he's fine. <laughs> uh, as all the China is. And I asked the question, isn't there a moral issue there? Don't you feel as a professor a moral obligation mm -hmm. not to be doing, playing that game? And now I'm told when he goes around and, and, and pushes his book, like I'm pushing my book, uh, he starts off by saying uh, that uh, I really meant to leave a question mark on the book, but my publisher <laughs> dropped it off, and he blames his publisher. But this is binary thinking. And this is really dangerous, folks. And it's happening in the US right now. 
America is in bad political shape. Uh, we have poseurs and amateurs that are at the top, and, and, and they don't know what they're doing. Um, and when the US system is needed to be at its, at its best, it is not at its best. And so what do we do? Uh, where do we go? Well, uh, I feel very strongly on this, that uh, we need to consider China as special in some very important sense. You know, the history of the suffering people. Uh, it has, what, 21% of the world's population. Uh, it has to be respected. And when I write my columns, uh, which are viewed in America as pro-Beijing, one reason is, is that I try and write about the, the people who run that country with respect. And I say to myself, if I got up in the morning and I had to feed 1.4 billion people, would that be an easy job or would that be a hard job? I think that'd be a hard job. Trump gets up in the morning and only has to feed a quarter of those people, that, that number. So put that in, in a certain context. Do they make mistakes? Yes. Do we make mistakes? Yes. Uh, so that uh, we have to believe that, that somehow there is a soul for peace, if I can use that word, a soul for peace. And how do we nurture and see that soul for peace flower? Um, how to do that? And I was at a, 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 a breakfast meeting this morning, Dennis was with me, with some people from Tomasic, you know, that big thing where the, you, you know, there's not enough people in, in Singapore, so everyone has to do two jobs. So basically, the Tomasic is like where the Federal Reserve meets Morgan Stanley, you know? And, and, but they're brilliant. And I, I'm trying to figure out a way that I can take my 401k and get them to, you know, I'd like to move it out of Citibank and give it to them because I think it a much better return. Um, but we had a very good discussion about this issue with a, with a lot of different suggestions and points of view and, uh, uh, and so forth. And there was a real feeling in the room uh, about the urgency and the importance of this issue. And I took quite a few notes on it, and we had quite a good discussion. And that's what I would like to do right now, is to have a really good discussion. I think you pick up some of the pieces that you put in here, particularly those that you have actually written in introduction. Mm -hmm. And one part which, is said, which says binary baloney. Binary baloney. I like that. That's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> no uh, question mark. Sorry? No question mark. No question mark. <laughs> that's right. But there is a question mark for Beijing consensus. Yeah. Yeah, so um, before we go into Q&A, uh, uh, I would like to ask you just, just one question first, uh, which is that uh, you said that you're worried about, uh, in your conversations with uh, Singaporeans today and mm -hmm. yesterday, that you're worried about what's happening between China and, and the United States. And so, the potential downside. And the potential downside. Yeah. So I'm actually curious, what are the potential downsides that you're specifically referring to? Because if you think because in your book, in the introduction, you actually said that you don't think war can happen. No, it's a ridiculous idea, right? So what kind of in-between are we talking about? We're not talking about, you know, peace is not quite, you know, true peace is not quite likely. War is also probably, you know, I agree with you, you know, so far apart, you know, it would require a, uh, a lot of logistical moves for them calamity. to actually go into war. Total calamity. Yeah, so what, what, what are we looking at? In between. Well, my, my view on this is that we talk often about world order, mm -hmm. peace and security. It's, a, you know, it's only used 8 million times a day at the UN and so on. Mm -hmm. But it has some meaning. And, and it, it seems to me that the world order that we have now with the rise of China and the, um, the uh, shakiness from the US side, is the way I would put it, I mean, drawing from the Iran Treaty, TPP and so forth, all those things. It seems to me that, 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 that peace and stability is going to be hard, it's going to be hard to maintain mm -hmm. if the United States and China are at it all the time. If, there's, if the level of trust is very low, uh, if, the, if the sense of com competition is, is of win-lose is very high, and, and if the sense that you know, China wants to take over the world and the US wants to contain China, that's going to, if the American default position is going to be go back to the Cold War and to relive 1989 and wait for the Great Wall of China to fall over, like the Berlin Wall, that's going to be the test of American diplomacy. If that's 
what it's all about, I think we're going to have an unstable world. Now, what does that mean? I think it's going to have negative economic consequences. I think it's going to make planning very difficult. Uh, it's going to make um, joint approaches to things very difficult. It's going to make it very difficult countries like, mm -hmm. skillful countries like uh, uh, Singapore to, to, main, to play both sides of the street, mm -hmm. which you guys do brilliantly most of the time. Um, and that's exactly what you ought to be doing. Uh, but uh, so my view is, and this is kind of far out, but here we are. Uh, and that is that what we need is a kind of condominium relationship between Washington and Beijing. By which I mean, and I think there needs to be a very high level of coordination and joint consultation on decisions. And, and it, it will disadvantage some of the smaller countries. And there, you know, it won't, and the Japanese won't like it particularly. Um, but it, it's, I think it's going to be the only way to manage the world over the next 30 to 50 years. And if it doesn't go that way, I think we're going to go through a, a really rough period. So by condominium, you know what I mean? A condominium board, and I'm sorry, uh, maybe Lee Kuan Yew, when I interviewed him, brought out the inner authoritarianism in me. But, but, I, but I, think, I think that, that you know, that would be, of all the possible worlds, the best one I could think mm -hmm. of. That's what I mean. Thank you. I have more questions, but I'm going to leave you up for you. No, you're too sharp. Let them in. <laughs> Hi, guys. Good evening, uh, everyone. And to you, uh, Professor Tom Blake, good to see you again in Singapore. I have two short questions. Uh, by the way, my name is Ace. One question only. Okay, one question. Okay, I'll choose. Uh, do you think that uh, US and China will ever go to war, as what you said? And if, if, if that happened, touch wood, of course, do you think it, it will lead to World War III? Thank you. I think that, I think that if, they, if, they, if there's serious conflict, it will be World War III. But I, and I, I think there could be some brushes, you know, uh, particularly in the South China Sea. I mean, our Navy guys are just dying mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, have a little fun. And the Chinese uh, pilots, the t top guns, you know, they, they really want to have, have a go at it. Yep. And, and, you know, you, these are, some of these are very young people with a lot of testosterone. And, you know, she may say world peace you know, over there in Beijing. But, you know, you get down to the level of, of reality, mm -hmm. and, and bad things can happen. I mean, every time we've had war, we've, America's always created atrocities that weren't in the master plan and so forth. It just, it, it just adds to the uncertainty. And, and the way that weaponry is done these days, it's just so fast, and things happen, you know, in a way that, that lead almost automatically to escalation. But, but I, as I say, I'm an optimist. But what I'm, tr what I'm trying to say is that, that I think China and the U.S. can achieve this level of cooperation, but I want this level of cooperation. I want to take it up, up, to, up to there. That's what, I, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm preaching. Now, is that, how realistic is that? I don't know, but I'm, God damn it, if I'm going to write a book called Destined for War, I'm just not going to do it. I don't care how many copies Malin can sell. I'm just not going to do it. All right? Uh, hope that answers your question. My name is Min. I work in a venture capital firm, which received money from Tomasek. Um, my question is, what we see today is um, very different from the Cold War, right? In is what from the Cold War? Very different very from different. the Cold War in right. that China, the Chinese Communist Party is a successful economic actor. Right. So what is your sense, um, therefore, of the rest of the countries, especially the ones that surround China or interact a lot with China? Are, they, do, are we in a state now where Chinese success threatens America's ideological advantage, right? People, like, let's say I saw that China's licensing its face, facial recognition software to Zimbabwe, right? And so it's kind of exporting now its um, draconianism or authoritarianism, right? So wh how is that different, right, from the Cold War? And what are we going to witness in the decades to come? Well, that's, a, that's an awfully good question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, the... Uh, I mean, the best way to, to answer that really is to, is to understand that, uh, first of all, to go to the starting point of your question, China um, has on its border 14 countries, right? Some are friendly, some are not. Uh, the United States has on its border two countries. None are threats. Canada, Royal Mounted Police, not a threat. Come across with the horses. We have them, we'll have them down by Buffalo. You know, they won't get past Buffalo. And then from the south, from Mexico, you know, we have invasion. It's already occurred. Illegal immigrants and so forth. 
uh, uh, that sort of occurred. And that kind of worked. That's actually been working pretty well until Trump came along. So America is in a very different geopolitical situation, and I don't think understands China's geopolitical situation. It doesn't understand what it would be like to have 14 countries on its border, one of which, for instance, Vietnam, which is a tough customer. Right? Henry Kissinger famously said, what do you think of Vietnam after the Vietnam War? And he said, well, I think with Vietnam, you can do almost anything in Vietnam except fight them. <laughs> they, they always seem to win somehow. Uh, so if you go from that, per that perspective to the, the export of values, uh, I don't think that America's ideological advantage is very huge right now. I don't think people, I mean, I think we are aware in America, not we, some of us in America are aware of our shortcomings in terms of ideological purity. I mean, let me explain to you. 20 years ago when I tried to say, look, don't think of the United States and it's like China or whatever as black and white. Okay? Think of everything as a longer continuum or the truth is relative, a longer continuum. It was a little hard to sell. It was a little hard to sell because of, in America because of our self-image. People said, what is this guy, some sort of commie? But now, with what ha what's happened in the United States, particularly the 2008-2009 financial crisis, which was triggered by Wall Street, right, the Wolf of Wall Street, right, that we've lost a lot of our moral edge. And I don't think we're looked to as much as we used to be in that regard. And I think a lot of people look at China and they say, well, it's not, you know, there's no consensus that ch the China way is the way we want to do it. But, you know, you had a measure of authoritarianism or authoritarianism here in this country, and I would argue it's worked out from a results analysis mm -hmm. and endpoint very well, that there's more than one way to bake a cake. There's more than one way to run a country. And we've got, I think, sir, to go on the other side of your question, the United States has, has got to stop going around the world giving lectures to people on how to run their country. And, and I think, we, we, you know, let's get our own house in order. Let's get more of our black males employed, not and get them out of the prison. Um, let's worry about some of the justice issues in the United States. Now, in terms of the facial recognition, everyone wants to do facial recognition. If the Chinese want to sell facial recognition, they go to the FBI. The FBI love to have it. So, um, I, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not so sure that, I think it's more of a product than an ideological expression. Um, but um, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but it's a really, really good question. I live in Singapore, but I'm originally from Taiwan. Okay. So I understand diplomacy lobbies and this morality that you're talking about. I mean, back many years ago, the whole Chiang Kai-shek thing in the U.S. to support one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, since I've lived in Singapore, I also understand what OB markers are, which is right. out-of-bound markers. Right. So I wanted to ask you um, about China and the United States OB markers for each other. There are some things that I think both countries will not tolerate mm -hmm. if the other country gets close to that. Mm -hmm. For example, in the US, we all know about energy and oil and all that. Once that starts to, to come into a problem, you know, the, the, the action items start to pop up for mm -hmm. the US. For China, I would think something like Tibet, Taiwan and all that. If that starts to come about, you know, they would feel like they need to do something. Right. So I think those, those markers, those um, drivers, if you will, you know, what in your mind in today's world is, is, is going to get the two of them to gear up? And, and as you said earlier, you don't think that, that this is going to happen, that, that there will be annoyances and all that, but at what point do you think the two countries will really get, get at each other's goat? What, what, what kinds of conditions need to happen where it looks like, whoa, this is not quite what we've seen before? Right. You better buy a few of my books. I'm telling you, these, these questions are good. Um, <laughs> the, uh, or go send your students, to send your children to LMU. Um, take my course. But uh, I think, let's just talk about Taiwan for a minute, because obviously that would be of some particular interest to you. I was asked at lunch by a very smart man from Singapore, uh, or maybe at breakfast, if, if China keeps pushing on Taiwan. I think that I think the Chinese believe we wouldn't do anything, but I I worry that they're wrong, and I think that could be a trigger. That's why I, when I was in China Daily, I said. 
please, you know, please keep your you know, self-delusion to a minimum with regard to that America's washed up. I mean, and uh, the U.S. Pacific Command uh, out of Pearl Harbor, you know, they're serious people. They got serious boats in the water there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, bad stuff can happen. I, I'm told, and I guess it was reported, and I don't know the exact details, but, uh, but one time when Obama met Xi, or, or it might have been who though, Hu Jintao, uh, he, he listed two or three things that China probably better not go there. And I think Taiwan was on, you know, you can screw around the South China Sea up to a point. Mm -hmm. But, the, you know, I think Taiwan was on that list. It creates political problems in the political culture of America where we still, as this gentleman was suggesting, feel that we are the moral superior. And that therefore we have to defend the values that we, you know, that we believe in. I mean, you know, if you go back historically, the Kuomintang was as monstrous a, a government as the, you know, as the Chinese communists were when they took over. They were just two versions of, of, of repression. Uh, it took a while for Taiwan to evolve into what it is now. I think the Chinese would be crazy to uh, militarily try and acquire Taiwan, but it's in their DNA they feel that they have to do it, mm -hmm. that it's part of their historical inevitability. And, and then so then the United States, what's the population of Taiwan now about? 20 what? Yeah, th that's what I thought. That's about the population of Malaysia. Um, that, you know, you have to choose between 25 million and 1.4 billion. Well, that's a tough call, you know? I mean, so that would be one trigger. Um, I don't think the Chinese are, uh, want to acquire territory like the former Soviet Union did, but they would like to acquire economic sectors and be dominant in certain economic sectors. I mean, I think what we, what we have to understand is that they got 1.4 billion people and they have to manage that. Now, if they don't manage that, they're gonna be out. Now, if they're out, John Bolton will be very, very happy. But a lot of people won't be very happy because the country will come apart and, and there'll be a lot of suffering. And, you know, I hate to say it, but I think Lee Kuan Yew is right that, that better off the Communist Party continue in a competent way to run the country than the country comes apart. It's a lesser evil, but that's the real world, a lesser evil. So, so there's, so there's that, that issue. Um, other issues that could arise between the United States and China, uh, I, don't, I don't see them as being so fundamental and existential to both, which is why I think it, this can be managed and why I want to do it in a condominium way. In other words, I think my list is really rather short. As long as we understand, A, we have to compete, China's going to try and get the best deal it can. It might even cheat occasionally. We, of course, the United States has never cheated on anything whatsoever, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, you know, I mean, so, we, you know, what is on their list that we, you can't be touched and what, what can, we, can we work on? Uh, the, RAND, the RAND Corporation, which is, the, as you know, very well-known uh, think tank, uh, did a, a secret project for a while with the, uh, the Central Party School. And the idea was to do a list of priorities. Hmm. And, and to almost do like a top 100 or something like that. And they were working on it, and then I think somebody higher up, I won't say who it was, found out about it and stopped the project, which was unfortunate because that was the kind of thing that I think they ought to be doing because it gave away the priorities of, I mean, if you're doing it honestly, then you could, it, be almost, it was almost an intelligence operation is the way they looked at it. Uh, another thing, by the way, that, but I think the thing you have to worry about most with regard to the U.S. is the media and public opinion. You know, I just got to go back, very quickly go back to that. Because they, you know, in the end of 1998, 99, something like that, there was this, the Cox Commission on Chinese spying. And Congress did this incredible investigation, right. and they found out that Chinese were spying on the U.S. Mm -hmm. That was a page one story. I was shocked. Foreign countries spy? Israel spies on us too? Those sneaky French <laughs> spying on us? You know, and, but they made a big political issue out of it because they wanted to get Clinton. They couldn't get him on, on Monica. Uh, so they tried to get him on, you know, China. soft on China. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the weight of the evidence wasn't enough, but that's coming up again. 
China is uh, our enemy, and so on and so forth. I'm in favor of spying. I think the more we know about the other country and what they're doing, the better. You know, and this, I was telling Dennis, they have, you know, China's been trying to do these, these Confucius Institutes, you know about them? Yeah. Where they, and to teach chi the Chinese language, which I think is great, but now some campuses are reconsidering the deal because the Chinese uh, instructors have uh, uh, pro-Chinese uh, opinions. Now that's a shocker. <laughs> Isn't that a shocker? I mean, and, and express them to the students. Now that is really, that's a scandal. And, and of course, when we go over there and we have our Voice for America and so on, we don't do anything like that, right? We, nothing like that whatsoever. And, uh, and also, you know, are we so insecure about our own values that we, we're afraid that these students' minds will become, you know, Manchurian candidates and, and so on? I mean, it's just, it's laughable, but it's happening again, and I can't believe it's happening. And so you got to watch that. You really have to watch that. First off, I actually am rather curious to know what are your own uh, personal views regarding about the, the upcoming and unprecedented uh, Su uh, summit between the U.S. and North Korea, particularly when it comes to a great deal of involvement with with a number of major countries, particularly with the U.S. and China on said summit. I think I know. I mean, I think the problem with the the, the negotiation dimension of the the split in the Korean Peninsula has been the level of involvement issue, which is to say, I don't think you get anything done with North Korea at a mid level. Mm -hmm. The negotiators are too scared out of their minds to give an inch. They go back and they'll be chopped up. And it can only happen at the top level. So unless you get the top people together, nothing's going to happen. And whenever we, when Carter went over there, something good happened. Clinton went over there, something good happened. Um, so now I wish we, our president were not Trump, but he is our president. So if you say to me, would you like the idea of Trump getting together with Kim Jong-un? That seems sort of scary. <laughs> Between the two of them and their buttons, I don't know what the hell's going to happen. You know? <laughs> but on the other hand, if you say to me, are you against it? I'm not against it. I think it's very important. I think it's the only way it could possibly be settled. I'm slightly optimistic on this one, but I have to tell you, I have been overly optimistic on the Korean North thing Korea. for too long. Mm -hmm. I admit that, mm -hmm. but I'm going to stay with my losing hand, and I'm going to say that I think that the, the North Koreans have really figured that there's no more room down the road they're on, and that they finally it's sunk in. And the Chinese, you know, will get very. But actually, Trump has said some nice things about the Chinese involvement, and and part of the reason for that is the Chinese have been very patient with North Korea. I mean, you know, our approach to everything is to go with a sledgehammer and change the regime. Right. And China says, oh, my God, well, there'll be, you know, 10 million crazy North Koreans mm -hmm. coming at us, and we got enough problems with the Uyghurs and everything else that's going on. We don't need that, right? So, so the Chinese are very patient, and they were saying now, you know, communism is really great, but economically mm, it could be improved a little. You know, why don't you try this, why don't you try that? I once wrote a column and I said, if North Korea doesn't know how to fix its economy, just subscribe to China Daily's weekly business section, <laughs> which explains everything they're doing in China, and it's pretty much working. And they've been doing that, and they've been doing that. And I, I think with this new generation, this, this kid is running the thing, I think that's what they want to do. And, and I think so far, you know, he's, uh, I think, under the tutelage of... of of, uh, of Xi Jinping, I think he's outmaneuvered Trump at the moment. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't really, I mean, I hope he's outmaneuvered Trump because I want to see peace. I don't really care whether Trump's been out, but, but when, when, when Trump, if there is a deal and, 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 and it goes down in Singapore, when Trump goes back to the US, the media will be, Trump does it, you see. And, and, and in fact, he didn't do it. He you know, just showed up and didn't make a total fool of himself and went back to Washington and big peacemaker, but the people who did it were basically the president of South Korea. Won Chi Yun, yeah. Who I think should get yeah, a, he did a good right? job. Nobel mm -hmm. Prize. And, uh, and the Chinese, who, who are, nothing major is gonna happen there unless the Chinese are okay with it. And, and he, I think they're okay, they, you know, they, they have better, wonderful trade relations with South Korea. 
Mm -hmm. If you went to them, if you were God and you went to them and you said, okay, China, uh, the, the fun days are over. You can have relations with North Korea, South Korea. Which one do you want? History keeps on moving. The history hasn't ended. Right? I, I want to tell you, I have to tell you this story because I love the story. It's very quick. It's about South and North Korea. And if you've heard it, but if you haven't heard it, you can use it. All okay. course you can. So God is very bored. You know, he's up there with the angels and the harps and everything. And it gets pretty routine after a while. So he says to St. Peter, would you bring up to me tomorrow the, the two purest souls that died today? And I feel I've lost contact with the real, you know, my, the, real, the real souls. And bring them up, and I just want to, uh, you know, the person who has the best soul, bring them up. So St. Peter thinks God's kind of losing it. But what is he going to say? Because he's God. So... He says, yes, sir, and he says, yes, Lord. And he, he comes back a few hours later. He says, God, I, I'm, ha I'm not fighting you on this, but it, the problem is it's a tie. Mm -hmm. We measured the souls, <laughs> and the whiteness of the souls of two women are exactly the same. I don't know what to do. So God said, I've got eternity. Bring them up both up. I'll talk to both of them, right? <laughs> so, well, the other thing, God, is you won't believe this, but one of the women is from North Korea. And the other one is from South Korea. God said, so what? Bring them up. I want to talk to them. So they come up, and, they, and they're in the presence of God, and they're, they're shaking. You know, and, oh, my God. And God says, now relax, relax. We'll just have a nice little chat. And, and you know, I'm God, so you know, I, I know everything. I'll tell you what. Each of you can ask me one question, and I will answer it. And they confer, and they say, God, actually, we have the same question. What's the question? When will North and South Korea be reunited? <laughs> and God pauses, and he said, oh, that's a tough one. Not in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, no. And that, going? and that will make a South Korean very sad. <laughs> That's hard to beat. <laughs> um, Phil Lutton, I run a very small consulting company. Yes. Um, and I'm going to ask a very short question. With the, with the rise of China and uh, um, US still a very, uh, very strong power in the world, where do you see global institutions like the United Nations going forward, let's say 10, 10 years, 15, 20 years from now? That's it. I think actually, if the next American administration takes the view that the global institutions are extremely valuable, both in advancing national interest, harmonizing conflicting national interest, and in developing a more stable world order, which had been somewhat hypocritically, but still basically the basic American position, I think with the rise of China, I think the rise of China helps because the Chinese have been very uninvolved in these institutions, very low key and so forth, and been very reluctant to put resources into them because they couldn't see how it worked for them. But they've changed. And one reason they've changed is because of the vacuum that the American withdrawal from the internationalism uh, has created. And into a vacuum in politics, you know, all politics of course a vacuum, and the Chinese are going into it. Well, go, in going into it, I think they're seeing there's some rewards. There's a war, rewards in terms of legitimacy. Uh, there are war, rewards in some other ways. And, and, and so I think if the U.S. comes back to where it was philosophically on these issues, I mean, I think actually that could move it in a good, good, in a good way. Now, you remember in uh, the late 90s, China's uh, premier was Zhu Ranji. I, if I could do one guy to interview, anybody in the world right now, it might be Zhu Ranji. I think he was a ph phenomenal in the spirit of, of uh, you know, Deng Xiaoping. And he, he was the guy who absolutely carried China on its back into WTO mm -hmm. because he felt that was essential for the modernization of, 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 uh, of China. And I'll tell you a qu very quick story. At that time, the, the, when he was moved, when they d decided to cross the Rubicon into WTO, that time the Clinton people were in power, and I'm not particularly partisan, but 
actually, of all the administrations in terms of handling China, I think the Clinton administration was actually the best because they didn't know what the hell they were doing. And, you know, they didn't, and they didn't, and they had no idea, and they, all they said was, let's just try and make some money. And, and that's okay. And, that, and the Chinese responded to that, and that was fine. And then they, they built, built up some good personal relationships. One of the best was a woman named Charlene Barshevsky, mm -hmm. who was Clinton's chief trade negotiator, a brilliant, brilliant woman. And she developed a very good relationship with Zhuangzi. And, and she told me the story. One time she used to call at her office, and the secretary says, it's the premier of China. Can, can you take the call? And so, you know, Charlene said, yeah, I get to take the call. So she picks it up. And it's Zhuangzi in Beijing, and he goes, Charlene, I need a favor. What's that? This WTO thing, it's got so many rules and regulations. And we've got, uh, what, how many provinces are in China? 29, 39? We got all these governors and all these provinces, and they're coming to Beijing, and they're trying to figure out how they fit into this and how it works. And I don't know the answer. All I know is I want us in it. And uh, so she says, would you like me to come to Beijing and sit with them and you know, we'll, we'll talk it over. And she said, I would love it. And she got on the next plane, you know, more or less. And she went to Beijing and they, they sat for two days and discussed it and it really worked. And, and, but it took someone like Zhu Ranji to say, we need your help. We don't understand this well enough to, that I can explain to my people in a credible way how it's going to work, you see. And so I, I think that's a good thing. And I think we need to do much, much more of that. And also, I think we need to look at, not, we don't disagree on every issue with China. Some issues we agree on, and they have things to say, contributions to make. Let's look, let's look at it in a positive way. Why does it always have to be negative? And that's how I look at it. But in your world as a consultant, I see the, in the near future, next two, three, four years, quite a bit of uncertainty. I don't, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't want to have to plan right now, because I wouldn't know how to plan when, as you know, it works best for you when you have political certainty and stability. That was what the brilliant Lee Kuan Yew did, right? He made Singapore a place where people could invest and not get ripped off in the, in the corrupt courts and bring in money and bring in training, you know, and, and so on and so forth. It was one of the keys to, to your success. I'm Roshni Benedet. I'm a journalist and occasionally an adjunct professor at NUS in communications and new media. Cool. My question to you is on the United States, China, and faith. It's and fate? And faith. Is that an... Oh, faith. Faith. I thought, faith. I thought it was a new cafe or something. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Faith. Good old faith. Yeah, I got, I'm um, with you. It, it's not often we get a Jesuit uh, prof a professor from a Jesuit university or any religious university for that matter. So right. I'm taking full advantage of it. Good. Um, so well, I'm a, I'm a well-known saint. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm I sure. almost made that cut list for the meeting Lord, the Lord. I can see the halo right yeah. here. Um, <laughs> I digress. You're going to go far in life. <laughs> I digress. Let me get back to my question. No, I like your digressions. Go okay. <laughs> so, Same according Tom. to the, um, an article by the British newspaper The Telegraph, and I quote, the number of Christians in China is growing so steadily mm -hmm. that by the year 2030 it could have more churchgoers than America. Um, there are similar numbers in Singapore, by the way, in terms of a Christian revival, Is that right? a, a faith revival. Uh -huh. But once again, I digress. I digress so I, I, I'll leave that question for another book and another day. Um, but my question to you to, today is, what are your thoughts on, on this Christian revival in China, um, the causes for it, and where it will take the landscape of the country moving forward with U.S. relations or without? There's a new book that uh, came out last year, I, and I, I wish I could, it's the name and the author has escaped me, but it's a brilliant book on the religious revival in China. You know the book I'm talking about? Okay, any event, um, and uh, it is happening. It's a real thing. I mean, one explanation is that it's filling uh, the vacuum created by the decline in the religious value of communist ideology. She understands that. He is insisting the universities just go back to mm -hmm. teaching socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, uh, and, uh, but I, I think he sees it as a force that has to be managed rather than tomahawked into the ground because it's too big. Uh, the trick will be to, to, that it doesn't 
become something that threatens the sovereignty of the state. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest issue with China, the sovereignty. And that, uh, and I think uh, I, in my columns, uh, not because I'm a Jesuit university, not because the, the, uh, uh, the Pope is a Jesuit, but because I think the Pope is a really great man, that I have been supporting very much the uh, efforts of the Pope and Xi Ranji to come to a deal, a res a, 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 an agreement on the appointments of bishops in, in China, which I think is a, a terribly important issue. And the Pope appears to be willing to secularize that process to a certain extent, and I totally support it. Naturally, the old fogies in the Curia are fighting him like crazy. And just like uh, Zhu Ranji travels with a large security operation now because of his anti-corruption campaign, the Pope, I'm, I'm sure uh, there's some people in the Curia, I, I think, that wish he would go to heaven um, because he wants to do this deal. And I think it's really important that it happen. George Yeo, who had been once a foreign minister here and was one of the smartest people I have ever met in my life, uh, it was, on a, uh, was on the first civilian advisory commission to the Pope, as you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and was able to brief me on some of these issues. So I know, know a little bit more about it than I ordinarily would. I think all of those things are real, and I think um, even in the United States, I think... Uh, I don't know with Dennis whether this is a, a factually correct statement, but I think some people prefer, say, LMU to, say, UCLA because there's a religious dimension to it. There's a chapel you can go to. No one has to go to it. There are masses you can go to. No one has to go to them. Um, more than half of our students are not Catholic, but, for, but particularly for parents, they like to give their children the option the religious option, which you can't get at a secular university. And so I think it may be a global phenomenon. I, I, you know, as long as these religions will just not f kill one another and fight one another, you know, li you know, live and let live. But I think if, if, the, if the Jesuit pope can pull off this deal with Xi, Xi I think it would be really, a really, really good thing. Because the only way it's going to work is we're going to have to, to compromise. Nobody's going to get 100%. We're going to definitely have war if, if, if that's the goal. You know, I did a book with, with Ban Ki-moon called Conversations with Ban Ki-moon, mm -hmm. and he says the best, most stable international agreement is one that is close to 50-50. If you've got 2080, you've got the seeds for the Second World War, the Versailles Treaty. If it's close to 50-50, you've got at least half or a little more, whatever, he, then you have something that is a stable molecule, you see? And so... Uh, I think that's a terrific observation and question, and, uh, and your side comments. I, I, we have an A to you. Well, actually, I think the, the question of religion, uh, this is one area where the Chinese state actually gives a lot of room for the people, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that it is necessary for, uh, you know, venting and uh, mm -hmm. letting off some steam. And there is an author that actually calls this blind eye governance. It's called what? Blind eye governance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, religion is one of the areas where the Chinese state actually gives some room. For, I mean, for the, I mean you know, just like the American state, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we're sometimes really stupid, but sometimes we're smart. Same <laughs> with China. Isn't that odd? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this lady fits. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anna Marie, and I'm a retired uh, German diplomat uh, from. Religion back to politics. Yes. Um, the last 70 years have seen a very, very close uh, transatlantic uh, partnership between the United States and Europe. And the actions of the American government in the last year seem to have endangered right. that. Right. Uh, we see a deterioration of that relationship. We see what I would call a, a vacuum. And that vacuum has been filled by China. You can see it, for example, in the close relationship. Uh, when it comes to the climate change agreement, the Paris Agreement, yeah. or the renegotiations of the mm. Iran Agreement. What are your comments on that? Well, that's another, good, another great question. And I'm not saying that to be patronizing. It's just a great question. Um, I mean, I mean I, two things. If you look at what China is aggressively trying to do with climate, I mean, they know they have a problem, and they know it's existential. And... Uh, and some of the Western climate groups recognize that. 
whereas the human rights groups in the West won't give China the time of day. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my uh, ideal scenario is there's a big fight between the human rights groups and environmental groups in the mm -hmm. West, and they liquidate one another. <laughs> and, and, and in the course of that, a condominium relation comes up in, in, in science rules. Yeah, that's World War III. Huh? <laughs> that's World War III. Yeah, that, you, that, yeah, that's World War III. <laughs> right, and it takes place with seals in the Antarctic, Arctic or something like that. Um, but, but to go back to your central point uh, with Europe, I, I think it's very important to understand. When Trump says that Germany doesn't pay enough for its military, okay, there's a lot of people in America that agree with that. When, when, when Trump says that the Europeans have been living off of us for 30, 40, 50 years, there's a, lot of there's a lot of support for that in the United States, that view, that Uncle Sam is Uncle Sap, mm -hmm. and that we've been taken advantage of. And they don't look at the, pl the pluses of that relationship, which is basically we dominated the world to a large extent. But, that, but they look at it as, as, as we're, we're chumps. So, and if you look at the facts, the Germans' contribution is not even, hasn't even reached 2% of its budget, under, is under the agreement. So again, I just, I get, want to get us off this black-white thing so we understand what's going on. But Trump's not operating in a vacuum on that. There's a lot of American feeling, same with Korea, American feeling, and wanting the Japanese to pay. And now you go back to history more than, you know, 11 minutes, and you know what the historical reasons are for that, but, but in terms of the politics of it, remember, America has no historical memory whatsoever, <laughs> which on the whole is bad. Right. It's occasionally good on cases in some certain situations because we don't have grudges. For example, the Vietnam War. There are people who fought in that war will, America, will hate the Vietnamese for as long as they live. But if you say to the American students, the Vietnam War, 20 years, I'll say, Oh, yeah, we had a war with Vietnam. Right. Oh, I wonder what that was like. Was that severe? You know? And so when Clinton wants to go to Vietnam, as he did, I think, in 1999, it wasn't a huge domestic hurdle because it wasn't, you know, it was like the Armenians and the Turks. Mm -hmm. They, re, you know, every other day they have a protest about it. America's not like that. It's a very short memory, and it's generally not good, but sometimes it is good. Mm -hmm. So, I, but I think the European thing, as long as Trump is in power, is going to be going to be an issue, and it does play into the China's hands. That's what I mean. It's not thought out. Even if the U.S. is right on some of the substances, if you push that, what are the consequences? What are the downsides? Let's think it through. Maybe the Germans are cheating on us, but if we make too much of a problem with Merkel, who's obviously an outstanding leader, and some sense of, of outstanding leadership, then is there a net gain or a net loss? See? But Pardon the expression, if you're bull in the China shop. Uh, I'm Henry Chen from East Asia Institute. My question is a follow-up to the lady's question. Because if you look at the Iranian things, yeah. the European Commission now is talking about setting up a separate banking facilities for the trade with Iranians yeah. and not going to use the U.S. dollars. Right. Now, the question is that if America is going to withdraw from the Middle East and you see the rise of this uh, Saudi, Turkey, right. um, in uh, Israel, will, they, will the world go into a kind of a Kinderberger traps in which China is not going to fill up the shoes of the United States, but the U.S. is uh, prematurely getting out of the world? I think what we mm -hmm. would say, what you say is that I think that the, national, the natural gravitational forces of world politics, whatever that means, I think we're going to go back into the shoes of some of these places. I think it's, we're going to go, right, Dennis? I think it's, you know, it's going to, you're going, to, you're going to whip back. Now, maybe with the speed of a backlash of taffy, uh, but it, I just think the way the world is structured, I think the things that, that Trump w wants to do because he's tapping into the anger in American constituencies, and th th don't those things, those things are sustainable over the long run, is what I would say. And, and I think a lot of these things will be correcting. And, um, you know, if, he, if, he, if he's impeached and you get Pence in there, you know, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure I'm happier about that because I'm, I fear Pence actually might believe in what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And that's really dangerous, yeah. so, you know. So, I mean, it's a nightmare right now, and I, I, I wish I could feel a little better about our country, but, um, but uh, I do know that I, I spent half of 40, 
five minutes with your prime minister yesterday. He is proud as a peacock that Singapore looks to be the likely site of the uh, of the uh, of the summit, mm -hmm. but uh, and, but his staff is is scared to death yes. that it's going to take place <laughs> because it'll be a titanic amount of work. We Logistical Dennis and I from security. Los Angeles are extremely happy we're here now <laughs> and not three weeks from now. And 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 uh, and I said to one of the members of the media staff of the prime minister's office, "How many journalists do you expect might come in?" And she said, so it might be as many as five to 7,000. Oh. And I said to her, that is my definition of hell. <laughs> five to 7,000 Western journalists. We're going back to LA, man. Yeah, we're, we're going, going to, to put LA. them. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much for being here.